you'd just come back from Cairo. Mm -hmm. what, was the, what was the mood? Well, I was in Cairo in January for the anniversary of January 25th, the start of the revolution. And I remember the days leading up to that anniversary. So in the run up to the January 25th anniversary, a lot of people were very anxious about what kind of turnout we would have on the streets because uh, state propaganda was saying things like they're going to burn Egypt down and they're going to be violent and all of that. But on the actual day of January the 25th, we had an amazing turnout. There were marches across Egypt, thousands, hundreds of thousands of Egyptians. I, I, I joined a very long march, took, about, took us about four hours to get to Tahrir. So I left Egypt on January the 29th and everybody was on a high. I went back to Egypt on February the 7th and everyone was on in a total low. Why was that? because we had the Port Said football stadium massacre where more than 75 <coughs> people were killed after a football match and that was followed very soon after by clashes between protesters and the Ministry of the Interior and in some cases soldiers as well. So people in the run up to the February 11th anniversary of Mubarak's downfall basically were feeling in a very different mood than, than they were in January. So just for folks who aren't aware, your arm is in a cast. <coughs> Can you explain what happened to you and when? I was in Egypt in November, and the day before Thanksgiving, I actually was not supposed to be in Cairo that day. I was supposed to be in Belgium, speaking at the European Parliament at a conference on women in the revolutions, ironically enough. And um, I couldn't go because I needed to be in Egypt. I, I, they bought my ticket, booked me into a hotel and everything, but there were clashes that were happening on a street called Mohammed Mahmoud Street between protesters and the security forces, both police and soldiers. And I was following these protests from Morocco where I was speaking at a conference and I, was, I live on Twitter and I, I literally was living on Twitter following the protests and just crying about what was happening and I had to be there. So I, I went to Cairo to basically be there but I needed to be on Mohammed Mahmoud Street. A lot of people have asked me, you're an opinion writer, you write these pieces about you know, where the revolution should be going, you don't need to be on the front line. So why were you at Mohammed Mahmoud? And what happened? And I needed to be on Mohammed Mahmoud Street because there's a group of Egyptians there called the Ultras, and they are soccer fans, basically. They're like groups of soccer fans who have been incredibly courageous. And they're often maligned as just soccer hooligans who are very violent and out of control. But what they did on Mohammed Mahmoud, Mahmoud Street was they basically helped to defend Tahrir Square against security forces because the days before I arrived, Security forces had invaded the square, burnt tents, shot people, shot out some people's eyes, killed others. So I wanted to be on that street to honor their courage. And the first day I was there, I was just in Tahrir Square, and then a friend of mine said, do you want to go to Mohammed Mahmoud? And I said, yes, I really do. So we went, and it was around midnight, the day before Thanksgiving. And what ended up happening is that we made it all the way to the front lines. And on the front lines, the security forces began to shoot at us. So there was, there was some men around us who said, duck, duck, you know, we, we've got to take cover. And they took my friend and I into an abandoned store on the pretext that they were going to protect us from the, the gunfire. But it ended up that they were plainclothes informants, basically, of the regime. And they entrapped us in this store and held on to us until the, the riot police came. The riot police came, they disappeared. I was left alone in the shop and I thought my friend had escaped. But my friend was also caught. And we were both beaten and sexually assaulted. He's a man, I'm a woman. We were both beaten and sexually assaulted. But he was taken to, he was, he was taken through the normal system, which is you're taken to a jail or a police station and questioned and either charged or not charged. But I was taken to the interior ministry and, and held for six hours, <coughs> excuse me, and then military intelligence for six hours. And about two or three of those hours, I was blindfolded and interrogated by military intelligence officers. And in the beating, my left arm was broken and my right hand was broken. And this arm needed surgery because the bone in this arm was displaced, which meant it went in like this. And so I have a titanium plate and screws around this bone until it heals, basically at the end of this year, I hope. Well, what was remarkable, I mean, that was a horrific, horrific experience. But I got a note from you, Melissa, to say, oh my God, go on Twitter, because Mona is tweeting through all of this. Now, I mean, th that was an extraordinary thing for someone to do. And you are, what I think about you, I think of you as an extraordinary storyteller. You know, you're a traditional journalist. You write for The Guardian and lots of other papers. But you're also a blogger. 
and you're a tweeter. And what happened in November was you were there in what role? As an activist, as a reporter? You, you kind of slipped through the veil and became the story. So how does that impact, particularly social media, how does social media impact the objectivity of a traditional reporter? Mm. Or do you see it that way? Well, first of all, I don't identify as a traditional reporter anymore. 9-11 killed objectivity for me. Well, I, I moved to this country in 2000. Before that, I was a news reporter, a traditional news reporter for 10 years in the Middle East. I covered many countries in the region. But after 9-11, objectivity died for me. I could not pretend not to have an opinion. I have very strong opinions. I have very clear biases. I don't believe in objectivity or neutrality. So I, I don't call myself a reporter anymore. I'm, a, I'm an opinion writer. But, and what I, what I was in Egypt was uh, I was an Egyptian fighting for freedom. And being on Mohammed Mahmoud Street, I was also the person who went to university there because it's also the street that has the main gate to the American University in Cairo. The campus has moved now, but when I was a student at AUC, the American University in Cairo, the campus main gate was on this street. And so I was tweeting. I mean, at one point, my friend Megid said to me, Mona, your life is more important than tweets. Stop <laughs> tweeting. <laughs> because, you know, there, there, was gu there was gunfire, there was tear gas, there was sirens. It was insane. And I was tweeting things like, this is so surreal. This is the street that I walked every day to go to university. And it's just full of sirens and the orange air of tear gas. So I was there as, as many things. And I think this is, and, and social media for me is both my biggest institutional backer because I'm freelance, I'm independent. So if I get into trouble, I don't have the Washington Post to back me up. I don't have Reuters to back me up. It's just me. So it's Twitter that backs me up. And that night, Twitter saved my life. Because while the, they were beating me, and I was protecting my head like this, I had my phone in my hand and it fell. And I remember very clearly as they were dragging me towards the interior ministry, I said, my phone, my phone. And on, you know, on some level, I don't know if I thought that they were going to say, okay, boy, stop beating her, she's going to get her phone. And then we're going to take her to the interior ministry. Because I really wanted my phone. And it wasn't that I wanted my phone because I'm addicted to Twitter. I wanted my phone because I realized on a very deep level that it was my lifeline to the world. So I lost my phone. It was lost in, in, in the ground. And every minute between that time and three hours later, when I finally had access to a phone, I had no idea what could happen to me. I thought, they're going to charge me with being a spy. They're going to kill me. They're going to rape me. They're going to put me, send me to jail forever. I didn't know what was going to happen to me. But three hours into the detention, someone, uh, some activists came into the room where I was held. Who was co they came to discuss a truce between the security forces and protesters. And they weren't really paying attention to me by this point. And so I asked a uh, uh, an activist to use his smartphone, and he got me on Twitter. And I sent out a tweet, beaten, arrested, interior ministry. And I swear to God, his phone died right after I sent it out. He was like, oh my God, <laughs> his battery died after I sent out this tweet. And it was a matter of seconds, because his phone could have died, and I would not have been able to send out this tweet. And I was told afterwards that after I sent out this tweet, 15 to 20 minutes later, hashtag free Mona, was trending around the world. So Twitter saved my life. Well, and I think it's fascinating to, s to do your vital statistics when it comes to uh, social media. So I looked in on her tweet, uh, Twitter page before we came out, and as of this afternoon, Mona, you have over 115,000 followers. That's crazy, no? That is crazy. <laughs> um, you have actually tweeted over 95,000 tweets. <laughs> That's crazy, too. Um, <laughs> And I don't think you're tweeting at the moment. <laughs> and I'm itching. <laughs> and, and, and I looked up something called your clout score. <coughs> now, I don't know if everyone knows clout, K-L-O-U-T. So Mona has a clout score of 70. And to put that into perspective, the other person that I found who had the same clout score as Mona was Justin Bieber. Okay? <laughs> So you're, you're looking at a rock star here, guys. <laughs> Autographs, autographs <laughs> later. So, you know, what I find really fascinating, not only are you a great storyteller, but you yourself have an amazing story to tell about your life. You, you were born in southern Egypt. Uh, you were raised, t talk about your early childhood and, and the journeys that <coughs> you took uh, that's, that's brought you here. I was actually born in northern Egypt, in Port Said, where this massacre happened. Oh. But my family is from 
my dad's side of the family is from southern Egypt, right. so they're, they're kind of the strict conservative right. upper Egyptians. But my mother's side of the family is from Hosni Mubarak's hometown. Boo. <laughs> so we have those two sides of the family. But my, my family, my parents grew up in Cairo. I was born in Port Said during very soon after the 1967 war, because my parents happened to be there during the war. So, but I grew up, the f I spent the first seven years of my life in Egypt as a, a member of a very large extended family, because my mother is one of 11, and my dad is one of eight. One of my aunts passed away, though, so she's, she is one of seven now. But I often like to tell my mum the story of my mother and her mother, because my maternal grandmother was pregnant 14 times, and 11 of those children survived, and the eldest of those children is my mother. So she's the eldest daughter. And I'm the eldest daughter of my mother, but my mother only had three children. And her eldest daughter, me, has chosen not to have any children. So when you look at this family story, and this story is not unique to me, and, and this is why I love storytelling so much, and it's something that came up in our session today. I think when, when media generally look at the Middle East and look at the so-called Muslim world, they look at it from a prism of conflict and they look at it from a prism of us and them. And for us who are from that part of the world, it's, it's, uh, it's our life, it's my grandparents and you know, my friends and, and all of that. So through the stories, what I'm trying to do is, is to show that my story is not unique. The fact that my grandparents moved from the countryside to the city Millions of Egyptians did. The fact that my parents moved from Egypt when I was seven to London. Again, millions of Egyptians did as a part of going out to get degrees. So it, it's, uh, wh what I'm trying to do is, is just give a human side to a part of the world that has just been looked at from a very narrow and very negative prism. So you moved to London at seven, and then later there's another move to Glasgow, of all places, mm -hmm. where they talk kind of English, but not, <laughs> you know, not that. Um, but describe what was going on within your family, because I believe your dad didn't have work, isn't that right? Well, see, when we moved to London at the age of seven, my parents moved, and when they were in Cairo, we had help. Everyone in Egypt has help. You don't have to be you know, upper class to have help. So my mom had a nanny who would help her with, with the kids. So they moved to London, and they're both studying. My parents are physicians, and they were both studying for their PhDs. So my mom at one point said to my dad, look, you know what? There's no help anymore. It's just you and me, and you've got to you know, step up. So my dad began to become much more involved in, in our lives and in helping my mom in the house and everything. And this really kind of, they were ended up reversing roles after they finished their PhDs because they spent a year in Glasgow where my mom was the breadwinner and my dad was the house husband. So here you had Muslim parents, Arab parents, Egyptian parents with complete role reversal. So I, I always say I grew up in a family that, that projected to my brother and I knowledge and education is the most important things. But my teachers, you know, were giving me very subtle signals in the UK at that time that this is not what a Muslim family is supposed to be like. Because I would tell them, you know, my parents are both studying for their PhDs and they would be shocked. I would tell them that my mom kept her ma maiden name and this is 1970s UK and they were shocked because most of them hadn't kept their maiden names, you know. So it, I realized at a very young age that very little was expected of Muslim women because I was bombarded with these stereotypes of what a Muslim woman is. And there was my mother supporting us. My dad was cooking and picking up the kids from school yeah. in 1982. And then you moved to Saudi Arabia. <laughs> <laughs> worst six years of my life. <laughs> How old were you when you moved? The worst possible age. We moved when I was 15. So I mean, being 15 anywhere is terrible. <laughs> but moving to Saudi Arabia from the UK at 15 is re as a girl is really bad. And I always say in the UK I learned to become a minority because in Egypt I belong to the Sunni Muslim majority. In the UK I learned to become a minority. In Saudi Arabia I learned that there are a hundred Islams out there because the Islam that I was brought up with at home had nothing to do with the Islam I was seeing outside in the streets on Saudi, in Saudi Arabia. Mm. And you began to wear the veil or yes. talk about why you did that. I, start, I wore a headscarf for nine years. I started wearing a headscarf when I was 16. I chose to wear it, and I also chose to take it off. But in hindsight now, I was just telling my companions on the dinner table that I, I wore a headscarf for nine years, and it took me eight years to take it off. And that speaks to the kind of pressure that, that a lot of Muslim women feel about what a good Muslim woman is. And I wore it for many reasons. I, I wore it because that's uh, what I learned, what was expected of a good Muslim woman. But I also wore it because I was striking this deal with God. When we moved to Saudi Arabia, I fell into a deep, deep depression because I could not handle the culture shock, 
the suffocation of this ultra-Orthodox religion that I found myself in, and I honestly thought I was losing my mind. So one day I said to God, okay, listen, God, they keep telling me I should cover my hair, fine. I'll do that, but just help me maintain my sanity. Somewhere along the line, God reneged on his deal because I felt like I was truly going mad because it was so difficult to, to, to try and live through this very suffocating, very misogynistic atmosphere in Saudi Arabia. And so my lifelines then became these feminist Muslim women I discovered on the bookshelves of, of the university I attended in Saudi Arabia. And I always say, God bless whatever renegade professor put these journals and books on the bookshelves because they literally, that's what saved my mind. And, and it was terrifying. And, and I always tell people that if, you, if something terrifies you that much, then you know you need it. Because it opened up to me a world that I knew I needed to help save me from this misogynistic, ultra-Orthodox religion. But it was also, wow, this is really scary. And I'm going to end up fighting a lot of things to go there. But it was the only thing I could do, and I became a feminist. And you describe yourself as a secular liberal Muslim feminist. Yes. Those are four words you don't normally see. Yeah. And that, could, that must confuse people, right? That's my word, Stephen. <laughs> my middle name is Confusion. I'm a huge fan of Confusion because, <laughs> I mean, as journalists, we're supposed to explain things to the world. My mission in life is to confuse you because what happens when, when you're confused, the signals in your brains are scrambled and they're kind of arrested and everything is stopped. And then I move in and I brainwash you <laughs> with what I want you to believe. At least and you're honest about it. And that's my mission in life, yeah. <laughs> totally. Yeah. No, so I'm a huge fan of confusion because what confusions do is they, de they dismantle stereotypes. So when you think Muslim woman, you think what my teachers in the UK thought, you know, some, some oppressed woman. And granted, there are millions of oppressed Muslim women, but there are other types of Muslim women. So my mission in life is to confuse you enough to, to give you a, an image of something you're not usually used to seeing. All right, so one thing that confused me about you, and I, you said that you weren't keen on the phrase the Arab Spring. Yeah. Why not? What's wrong with that phrase? Oh, I have many reasons. First of all, no seasons, no flowers, and no food items to describe revolutions, ever. It's a really yes. bad idea. And when they call it spring, it's always because when things start to go wrong, they want to say the winter of discontent. But it also, this is not an Arab thing. When, when people look at that region, to consider it Arab is so unjust to the other ethnic groups that are in the region. I mean, Egypt alone has Nubians, Amazigh, Bedouin, you know, so many, such a rich heritage and variety of ethnicities. Tunisia also has the Berbers and so many others. So it's not an Arab thing. If you told my, my friends from Aswan that you're a, mem you're a part of the Arab Spring, they would say, I'm not Arab and I don't identify as Arab. And in fact, Arabs have suppressed me and my ethnic identity. So it, it's very reductive and, and it, it doesn't help at all. So what do you prefer? <laughs> um, just the revolutions of the Middle East and North Africa. Because also when you use North Africa, you acknowledge that we're on the African continent. And for a lot of Egyptians, the only time that we remember our Africanness is when we're winning the African Cup. Yeah. <laughs> and we're like, yay, <laughs> we're Africans today. Yeah, okay. And you know, the press liked to grab onto that handle that it was a Twitter revolution or a mm. Facebook revolution. Mm. And I think that that particular phrase or theory has been pretty well debunked. But let me ask you a question. If there was no social media, no Twitter, no Facebook for those of extraordinary, mm. do you, how would last year have been different? Well, there actually was a point where there was no Facebook, no internet, no Twitter. You're jumping ahead now. Yeah, back. when Go the back. revolution happened, yes, when exactly. Mubarak shut down the internet. Uh, we'll get but yes, now. okay, you know, for, for a sector of Egyptians, social media became the avenue through which they could express things they could not express in the so-called real world. But not every Egyptian is on Twitter, and not every Egyptian is on Facebook. So yes, I, I, keep, I, I put those people in perspective, and I, and I see that they were able to use those tools, because they are essentially tools. But you know, I, I often tell people to remember cassette tapes and the role that they played in the 1979 revolution in Iran. Before Ayatollah Khomeini returned to Iran from exile in Paris, he was sending back tapes to Iran with his sermons that were meant to inspire Iranians to rise up. We don't call it the cassette tape revolution. We don't call what happened in Tiananmen Square the fax machine revolution or uprising. You know? We don't call Martin Luther putting up his list for the reformation, the printing press reformation. You know what I mean? So I, I think, it's, it's a, again, it's a way to reduce something that is very complex 
These are revolutions of courage. Social media did not invent courage. There was a lot of courage on the ground. And at the end of the day, you can tweet all you want, but unless you took yourself out and faced Mubarak security forces or Ben Ali security forces and looked them in the eye and said, I will not live with this anymore, there would not have been a revolution. We're going to go out to questions in a moment. You, you also have used the phrase uh, revolutions of the mind. Mm -hmm. what, talk about that. What do you mean by that? What I mean by that is that the, as exciting as the political revolutions that we're seeing in the region are, unless they're accompanied by a moral, cultural, and sexual revolution, they will fail. And a great example of that is this young woman who po posted a picture of herself nude on a blog. And she ignited this unbelievable debate. Now, she didn't go out on the street naked. She didn't say, come and watch me take my clothes off. She put a picture of herself on her blog. If you go on her blog and watch the counter, she gets a million followers every second. And people go on her blog to get really angry and pissed off and then go and say, this is really bad. But what, what she's done, and my contention, and this is what the revolution of the mind is all about, <coughs> Mubarak was a patriarch and a dictator in the real world. But he has a, a kind of a, a, a counter, a parallel dictator who lives in our mind. And what this young woman did was the equivalent, I believe, of throwing Molotov cocktails at the patriarchs in our mind, the, the Mubaraks in our mind. And in the conservative environments that a lot of these countries are, in which we have a military junta, who subject, which subjected female activists to so-called virginity tests and then justified those virginity tests, which are essentially rape by military doctors, to prove what? You know, to prove that these were good girls because they actually said, these girls were not like your daughters or ours. These are girls who spent every night in Tahrir Square doing God knows what. So in an environment where the military can violate you like this and they can remove your headscarf, as they did with a lot of these female activists, the right to remove your own clothes, in that environment, sex and nudity become the ultimate acts of revolution. And that's what the revolution of the mind is. And, and if you haven't seen it, check out uh, Mona's piece in The Guardian from last December. It is a stunning piece and, and an Thank amazing you. photograph, too, I, I have to say. The courage of this uh, young woman is amazing. So let's open it up. There's one right here. If we speak into the microphone, it would be great. Perhaps if you could identify yourself as well. <laughs> for the camera, for the camera. Hi out there. Um, Mona, I'm Laura Lauder and one of your biggest fans. Uh, we talked a little bit about, in our seminar today, about the role of the United States in foreign policy. And one of the things that you said, which sort of really struck me, was that when Hillary Clinton actually publicly admonishes the military junta, and yet, the hypocrisy of that, because our government supports the military junta with mm. a billion or more dollars per year, mm. how effective is it for Hillary to say this? And, 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 and you talked a little bit more about the issue of internal pressure plus external pressure. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate on that and give some specific examples of how the United States foreign policy can help support the revolution without undermining the revolution with our support, mm -hmm. meaning CIA operatives have helped with this? Right, right. And by the way, are you an advocate of cutting off the funds? Yes. I, I actually am at the stage now where I wish the United States, and I'm a U.S. citizen, would cut off its military aid to Egypt. Because we're at a stage where we have a military junta that claims to want to hand over power, but they also said they would hand over power six months after Mubarak's downfall, and that was back in September. So we have, we do not trust the military, those of us who are part of the revolution. But when it comes to the internal and external pressure, the ideal situation, and, and we saw that happen in 2005, one of the catalysts to the revolutions that we're seeing, or the revolution we're seeing in Egypt today, was a street movement that began at the end of 2004 that was championed by many local groups, including Kifaya, which means enough, but many others that were unaffiliated with any political groups. When they began to pressure the Mubarak regime internally, and the Bush administration began to pressure the Mubarak regime externally, you had an ideal coming together of internal external pressure, then Mubarak could not say, my people are not ready for democracy, as he too often said. So what happened with, with the Hillary Clinton situation is that when Hillary Clinton went to visit Egypt soon after Mubarak's downfall, no revolutionary would meet with her because the United States, five US presidents, supported Mubarak, knowing what a dictator he was. And so no one wanted to be affiliated with her. But when she made the statement that, that Laura referred to, this came at the height of the violence. And it was right after a woman was dragged through Tahrir Square 
stripped down to her underwear, and you saw soldiers stomping on her. So here is a junta that we, those of us who are US citizens here, are actively supporting with $1.3 billion a year. So Hillary Clinton spoke out and said it's a disgrace. At, on the same day that at thousands of Egyptian women marched, the junta, the junta now was cornered in the way that Mubarak was cornered in 2005. Because when it's just the US administration speaking out, it's very easy for the regime to say, but nobody cares about what you're saying. And also to taint anyone in, uh, internally with being an American agent or spy. When that comes in and there's in, uh, internal pressure as well, that, that you know, people say, okay, finally the Americans are paying attention. But unless we address, as again, US citizens, the double standards, it will fall on dead, deaf ears. Because even though she spoke out very openly, people said, but this is the very junta that you welcomed in DC just a few months ago, and you said they're a force of stability. So the US has to maintain a consistent line that is not nurtured by double standards, and if it doesn't want to cut off aid, at least make it conditional to the respect of human rights. There's one at the back then. Hi. Um, there was recently some criticism of liberal Islam. Sorry, can you go right here? I'm sorry, Cordell Carter. Nice to be here. Uh, and glad that you're were at our table tonight. But we spoke earlier at Drake's about uh, the criticism of liberal Islam by a very prominent critic, uh, female. And I was wondering if you can address that um, maybe at length, uh, rather than the short time to last night. So Cordell is talking about Ayan Hirsi Ali, who has been to the Aspen Institute and has spoken at various events. And Ayan Hirsi Ali, for those who don't know, is a, 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 a thought leader also and a former politician of Somali descent, who was a member of the Dutch parliament before she moved to the United States and joined the American Enterprise Institute. Since when she has, in my opinion, uh, advocated a very neoconservative line, and, and what distresses me even more is that she says there's no such thing as liberal Islam, and that basically all Muslims and all Islam uh, advocate violence and intolerance. And the reason that uh, I disagree with, with Ms. Ali or Hazi Ali is that as, as distressing as I find her personal story, and it's distressing on many levels, I think it's unfair to the rest of us who have been fighting for women's rights and who have been fighting to get liberal Islam out there to claim that there's no such thing as liberal Islam. Islam has a rich history of liberalism. There are scholars that go all the way back to the, the time of the Re European Renaissance that were advocating a very liberal approach to the religion that ended up actually influencing the European Renaissance because they were active in tra translating a lot of uh, Greek philosophy and they were very uh, active in, in the sciences, etc., etc. And they were getting into very vigorous debates that kind of borderline blasphemy today in a lot of conservative parts of the various Muslim worlds. So to ignore that heritage and to ignore the fact that we have liberal Muslim scholars today, and I mentioned yesterday someone like Amina Wadud, an African-American female scholar of Islam who led 100 of us in New York in the first public mixed gender Friday prayer. The, the azan, the call to prayer, was given by a woman. The sermon was given by Amina Wadud, and she then led us in prayer. We had women and men praying side by side. Now, this is the same struggle that you have in ultra-Orthodox Judaism for women to be ordained as rabbis. It's the same struggle you have in Catholic Christianity, where women also want to be ordained. And it's something that the um, Protestant Christianity has already taken care of. But, it, but it, it, it's a struggle. Liberal Islam, just like liberal strains of any other religion, exist. And so to ignore that not only belittles the work of these incredibly courageous scholars, but gives a very skewed vision of the tremendous and very diverse arguments that are happening in various parts of the Islamic world. And there isn't just one, there are many. And Ayan Hirsi Ali has chosen to leave Islam, which is totally her prerogative. But I find it very distressing, again, that someone who has chosen to leave a religion is then looked to to reform that same religion. I don't believe that is possible, because I believe that the reform belongs to us, those of us who are on the front line, who continue to identify as Muslims. And when I say identify as Muslims, this is where all these confusing labels come in. I was on the board of directors of, a, of the Progressive Muslim Union of North America a few years ago, which is one of the early liberal groups in North America. And we had a mission statement. And number one in that mission statement was, anyone who identifies as a Muslim is a Muslim. We don't have a litmus test. We don't ask you how many times you pray. We don't ask you do you fast. We don't ask you are you a cultural Muslim or a practicing Muslim. Because those are all traps. All we care about is do you identify as a Muslim or not. And that, I believe, when, when Ayn Hirsi Ali says that Islam is intolerant and all Muslims are inherently violent, 
she dismisses a lot of that very vital work that we all need to hear and the various alliances that we can make together. Hi, I'm Tuga Krieger, follower of Mona on Twitter. Um, <laughs> just wanted to pick up on something that you mentioned today that um, something that the revolution really is fighting for that sort of needs to be the next phase of the revolution is choice and that um, one of the explanations for the victory of the uh, Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafis in the, in, that now make up 70% of the parliament mm -hmm. is that there just wasn't a choice mm -hmm. because the political parties have been so decimated under the bar. Mm -hmm. So my question is, what can be done, so we've sort of quote unquote lost this election, mm -hmm. so like what can be done over the next five years mm -hmm. so that there is a choice and that mm -hmm. hope, when hopefully there will be the next election? Right. I think two things, I think the, the first thing we need to do is not to demonize the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafis. Because I think the more we demonize them and the more that we approach them with an attitude of fear and suspicion, the more that they will become defensive and, and, and nothing is achieved then. I'm not scared of the Muslim Brotherhood. I, all I care about is that if they do not perform what they were voted to do, that five years from now, I can vote them out. This, this, so I don't want the, the one man, one vote, one time. That is not going to happen in revolutionary Egypt. That, that's my main concern, that it doesn't happen. So once we end this, this approaching them with fear and suspicion, I think that the next thing that happens, that, and that needs to happen on the ground in Egypt right now, is that everybody begins planning for the next four or five years. These elections were a mess, and I always say though, they were our mess. Under Mubarak in 2010, 97% of parliamentary seats were taken up by his National Democratic Party. That's just ludicrous, 97%. So now we have, what, 45% Muslim Brotherhood, 25% Salafis, and the rest a whole bunch of others. Those whole bunch of others now have to start working seriously. There was a vigorous debate in Egypt after Mubarak's downfall of whether we should go straight for elections or whether we should have a presidential council and hold off on the elections until people were ready. But it's going to take a few years for people to be ready. And we wanted to move towards the trapping of a civilian leadership as soon as possible so that we could turn to the military junta and say, you are no longer needed. We're now going down a civilian route. So what needs to happen now is that people start planning seriously. We need political parties, but we also need lobbies, we need pressure groups, we need organizations like feminist groups, we need Christian rights groups. One of the, you know, it's very distressing, the attacks on Christians in Egypt, and I know it's something that a lot of people in the US follow, but a lot of Egyptians are speaking out against what's happening to Christians, and one of the most positive developments of the revolution is that Christians themselves in Egypt are speaking out, whereas in the past it used to be a very insular discussion in which they would not leave the church's gates to speak out. But now, you see demonstrations of Christian Egyptians and Muslim Egyptians speaking out back against that kind of bigotry and discrimination. So you need Christian rights groups, you need women's rights groups, you need queer rights groups, you need Nubian groups, every identity in Egypt, so that you can have that choice. And I think, and when I mentioned the Nubian friends that, that I was with, and, and this recognition that it's not just Arab, what, what that is telling me is happening in Egypt is that we went out and we rose up against Mubarak as Egyptians, but we are now recognizing the various identities that we can have. So you can be Egyptian and, whereas under Mubarak you could be only Egyptian, and only under Mubarak's definition of Egyptian. But now you could be Egyptian and Nubian, you can be Egyptian and Christian, you can be Egyptian and queer, you could be Egyptian and feminist. That, that's the kind of choice that we need to recognize now, so that as we do build up these institutions that Mubarak decimated, five years from now I have no illusions that the elections will also be a mess. But they will be 10% less of a mess than they were a few months ago, and so on and so forth. You know, you, you don't resolve these things in five years. It, it takes a while, but it becomes ours, and, and we're working on it. Okay. Uh, Rory Anderson. Um, thank you, Mona. Can you, obviously the, the, the I'm gonna wanna just take it to a higher level, the, the populist movement to really ask Mubarak, I think it's inspired a global movement, which we see in Occupy Wall Street. What makes, I mean, but yet, the, the Occupy DC movement is out right out in front of my office. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I see them every day, mm -hmm. and I wonder, well, I could see clearly what the activists in the Korea Square were pushing for. What are these folks pushing for? And everybody asks that same question, mm -hmm. but there are, and so when I go through the park, sometimes I'll ask them, what, you know, what's up, mm -hmm. and they're, you know, they, 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 it's a range and a variety of things, mm -hmm. but I guess my question, in the shape of looking at 
different activist movements mm -hmm. that are popping up around the world, which I mm -hmm. think were inspired, inspired in large part by mm -hmm. Tunisia and what you guys are doing at Tahrir Square. Mm -hmm. What makes an effective activist movement when you're trying to create change, right. even within institutions like even within the United States? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I moved to the U.S. in 2000, and one of the things that used to upset me the most was to meet young Americans who would say things to me like, the, the 60s are over, there's nothing I can do anymore, no one can change anything, what can I do, I'm just one person. And I would want to shake them and say, do you know what your peers are going through in other countries? Because I knew a lot of activists in the various countries I'd reported from who were risking their lives and we saw the fruit of their work as Tunisians, Egyptians, Yemenis, etc. rose up. So I think what watching Tunisians and Egyptians and Yemenis and Bahrainis and Syrians and all that, on an individual level, you can't watch those things without asking yourself, what would I do if I felt my government doesn't represent me? Because I'm watching all these people face death because they feel that their regimes don't represent them. And so, and you know, and that's a, that's a really scary thought. In the way that I said it, it terrified me to experience these feminist scholars that helped save my mind because it, it told me what I had to do. And that was jump into the ocean of feminism and leave behind the things that I was struggling with. So when everyone in this room or anywhere else watches the tremendous courage of Syrians who are going out on the street and, and truly facing death just for the right to speak, you have to, on, on a subconscious and a conscious level, ask yourself, what would I do in that situation? And so I think what, what the people in Occupy have done is they recognize that, okay, this doesn't represent me, corporate America, money in politics, whatever it is, so what am I going to do about it? Whether they've, they've found a coherent way to express it or not, that is for them to figure out. But I'm inspired by the fact or encouraged by the fact that they watch this happen and realize that, no, you as an individual do count. Because that's what's been happening in, the, in that part of the world. And that's why what's happening in that part of the world is changing the world forever. And one thing that, we, that came up in our, in our session today was it's changing that relationship between the rule and the rulers. That's what these revolutions are about. So you as an individual in this room, you have to ask yourself, what would you do if you felt your government does not represent you? How does that translate into real action? So I saw your interview, you interviewed Gloria Steinem, yes. and she admitted to being a hopeaholic. Yes. <laughs> would you describe yourself that way? I'm a, an optimistic and totally addicted to hope. And um, what, whenever I give public talks in the US, I'm always asked these incredibly gloomy questions, and they're so pessimistic. <laughs> and, and I tell them, I tell them, listen, everybody I know in Egypt who's on the street, truly facing death and torture and broken arms and eyes shot out by the security services, are incredibly optimistic. I mean, I said last time I went, people were very pessimistic until our march on the defense ministry. We marched to the defense ministry a week ago, I, I mentioned yesterday, on February the 10th, the day before the anniversary of Mubarak's downfall. We marched on the defense ministry not knowing what we faced. I mean, there were points where we were marching. And I gotta tell you, I was scared. I was scared because marches that a defense ministry in the past have often ended very violently. And just before we caught up with the majority of the march, this man came up to me and grabbed this arm really tight and hurt my arm and yelled at me. He said, what are you doing? Why are you joining this? Go home. And I yelled at this guy I was enraged. And, and if it wasn't for the fact that he was a senior citizen, my friends would have beat the crap out of him. But they were like, OK, just back off, mister. And so we, we had this very, very tense situation. And at some point during the march, my friends and I were looking at, at the palace walls because we marched past a palace, uh, a former presidential palace. And we were saying, that is an ideal scenario for a sniper. <laughs> we're like, sniper, OK, what are we going to do if there's a sniper? And they have used snipers. But that march invigorated us. It brought you know, 10,000 of us outside the defense ministry saying down, down with military rule as military police were protecting the defense ministry. So these are the kind of risks that are people are taking every day. So when people ask me these incredibly pessimistic questions, I say, why are you being so pessimistic? When people on the ground are incredibly optimistic, you do not launch revolutions out of pessimism. If you're a pessimist, then step aside and go home, please. There's no room for you in a revolution if you're a pessimist. Revolutions are essentially acts of faith and optimism. Because you have to believe, you have to have imagination, you have to dream, and you have to be an optimist because you have to believe that what you want will happen. And so she's a hopeaholic. I'm an incredibly foolish optimistic, optimist, and I'm going to hold on to that optimism because what is happening in Egypt is changing not just Egypt, but the entire world. I'm totally convinced of that. 
Well, we love your foolishness. We love your optimism. <laughs> we love your energy. Thank you so much, Mona. Thank you.